back to the rafters, which drops on September 17th with all six episodes. In a different format for the podcast, we have two guests for this edition. First, we'll chat to creator and writer Bevan Lee, and then standing by is Dave Rafter himself, Eric Thompson. I did speak to Bevan last year for a full one-hour podcast about his career. It's well worth a listen. So returning once again is Bevan Lee. Welcome back, Bevan. Oh, call me the ubiquitous Bevan Lee, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've, um, I've watched the first three episodes of Back to the Rafters, and at first impression, I can say that it does not skip a beat at all. It's like the show never left us. It had everything the original had in it. From a viewer point of view, it, it seemed that the writing was an easy flow from the original. How easy or difficult was it to jump back in? It's a bit like when you go to Cirque du Soleil and one of those people gets up there and does the extraordinary doubles, triple back, somersault, forward flip, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you go, well, you know, and that's clever, but um, it looks so easy. Um, <laughs> same thing. It, it was, it, look, it was staggeringly difficult, you know, to, to work out the way forward to create a show that was six hours long um, that had a reason for being that, that um, was valid for the world as it is now, as distinct from the world as it was when rafters left us. And it has changed a lot in those seven odd years um, that had a reason for being other than going, let's go back and see the rafters again. So um, I'm glad that you have found it so. And um, it warms my heart because I know that the extraordinary hard work that myself and the writers and my co-assistant uh, in the writing department, Catherine Thompson, and then Chris Martin-Jones, a producer, and all the directors and actors, that all the work we did um, has paid off and make it look like that. Yeah. So uh, in short, it was, it was ruddy hard. Well, I was absolutely crying in the first episode. You, you really oh, find the balance between, I guess, trivial family matters and then complete tragedy. Just so much heart for the viewer to relate to in terms of how Australian families operate. How do you strike the balance between being real, but also, you know, the soap element as well, for a better word? Well, yeah, the human drama element. Um, uh, uh, just with... Uh, that is the that is the skill that the show of of the show is working out. I often use the metaphor for the show that it's a big stick of candy floss with a dollop of lemon juice in the centre, and if you take away the candy floss, you'll wince with the sourness, and if you um, take away the lemon juice, you'll you throw up from the sweetness. And it's getting <laughs> the balance right, and that is the. Because overall with the show, we've always got the balance right, it sort of looks like an easy thing to do, but getting it right takes a lot of trial and error and questioning ourselves. And Because we do deal with some quite serious issues in the show, um, in both Pack to the Rafters and Back to the Rafters. So the dilemma you have is how to deal with these serious issues and yet have an optimistic and light show so that when you go optimistic and light, you don't look like you're trivialising the serious issues you're dealing with. Or when you go into the serious issues, you don't become turgid and gloomy and make the people who've come to the show for a bit of a laugh mm. turn off. So, yes, it is. It is um, uh, it, it's something that I'm quite good at um, organically as a creator so it comes easier to me, I think, than, than, than some people. But I know some people have come onto the show and tried to write it, and they simply haven't been able to get it mm. because it is very, very – the tolerances within which you can fall to get it right are extremely narrow. Um, so I'm glad you feel that we've succeeded with this. I, I personally – he says arrogantly, think we have. I feel very <laughs> proud. I, no, I feel very proud of it. I think we've really mm. hit the mark with the show. But I think, and I don't know if you feel it from the first three episodes, I think we have not, it's the same show, but it's different. I think that we are dealing with some stuff within the show that we probably wouldn't have dealt with, mm. you know, um, back six years before. 
um, certainly in terms of where Dave and Julie's marriage is at. Um, and uh, yeah, um, it does f seem to me to be not just a revisiting, but uh, an extension forward. And that's what I think um, Amazon wanted um, when they, and that's what I wanted to do. We didn't see the point of going back into the world of the show unless we could say something more. Yeah. Yeah. You used to like obviously writing for twenty two episodes of Rafters, except for the final season. Um, this season with Amazon is just six episodes. Is there an mm. overall theme for the six episodes? Um, so how are we how are we going into this new season? What should we we expect in terms of a theme? Um, I, I I think the theme, is, um, especially uh, to the that that you that. You, you you can love each other, but love can sometimes possibly mean not being together. Mm. And um, I wasn't necessarily, when I was approached to do it, that sure as to whether I wanted to revisit the world of the rafters um, because to me it was closed business. But I got my enthusiasm again when I sort of went into my own life and thought about what had happened with the major relationship in my life, which had um, uh, fallen apart on the basis wow. of two people who truly still loved each other, but life had brought them to a place where to go forward together, one of you would have to be untrue to yourself. Mm. Um, the, 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 what life, what we, what we wanted out of life had become so different that to proceed forward together, one of us would have to compromise ourself mm. and what, what we were getting from life. And that's sort of really what the story is with Dave and Julie, you know, I mean, where they find themselves in that position. Uh, and it's a really interesting, I, I don't know if you found it, you know, moving. I think some people will find it quite confronting that the, you know, the seemingly perfect couple um, but there's no such thing as a seemingly perfect couple. For you know, to me, what I found interesting was if we don't challenge the Dave and Julieness of Dave and Julie, and have them deal with issues and 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 find their way, you know, through with the family around them reacting to what's going on, then I think we sort of limit them so much as people because every couple, no matter how perfect, have issues that they have to face especially as the marriage goes on longer and longer and and i fell in love with exploring for myself that thing that i'd been through and transmuting it into the rafters and i i feel it presents a really different storyline one we wouldn't have done with them back in 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 the pack to the rafters incarnation mm -hmm. um and i think the audience are going to be very um excited by, moved by, challenged by, and ultimately um, warmed by the journey that, that uh, the, the, the six hours goes. Because the show, if nothing, is, is, is um, an optimistic examination of life. I didn't know if this was deliberate or this is something that was brought into the show, but I did notice that Julie Rafter, Rebecca Gibney, did the voiceover for the first episode, Dave for the second, and Rachel for the third episode. Um, that was always the way with the show. That was always the way with the show. Every episode was narrated by a different family member every week. But That, but, was, that was... But were the episodes more uh, centric to that character that was doing the voiceover, in, in more so in Back to the Rafters than it was in... Pack to the rafters. I just noticed that when Rachel did her episode, it was very Rachel heavy episode. Oh yeah, look, I mean, and I think that's to do with the fact that it is it is a um, a six hour piece. When you do a six hour piece, you have to distill the drama down. You can't have any, you know, you can't have you know entertaining dead air. You don't have the time to have entertaining dead air if you're going to tell a really valid story over six hours. Mm -hmm. So I think it's exactly the same thing. But I think it just probably didn't pop as much back in the pack to the rafters incarnation because um that was more a dramatic stroll through a landscape whereas when you've got a six hour uh story to tell you take a more 
I think, probably determined walk through the landscape of your storytelling. So that probably comes just from the fact that we are distilling, you know, the narrative down into the, um, uh, I used a, the liqueur of, um, a, you know, a very, very tight six hour piece. Um, whereas I would say, you know, Pack to the Rafters was drinking a nice claret, whereas Back to the Rafters is drinking a, a, a finely, distilled mm. liqueur because every, everything's tight has to be otherwise you know the amount of storytelling we story that we squeeze into the the six hours the only way you can actually you know it's a big story especially because it spans you know you not only have dave and julie's story but you've got ben and cassie's that's uh, uh ben's wife played by the lovely hey Hali. and then you've got ruby's story that's a 10 year old daughter and then you've got Nathan's story and then you've got Rachel's story and then you've got Ted's story. So you've got all of these separate areas which all feed into the central situation with Dave and Julie. But when you – and then, of course, you've got your, your comic zanies. I don't want to put them down by saying that, but, you know, Donna and Carbo are the ones who come in with the more, you know, wide-eyed – you know, the, yeah. the, 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 like the popular mechanicals of Shakespearean plays. And, and so when you've got all that to squeeze in and it's only six hours – uh, and you've got to you've got to go a true narrative and character journey for every character, because every ca- no no character is the same at the end of that six hours. They've all changed by the end of that six hours. That's the other difference, I think, with the sort of six hour miniseries piece. With rafters, it tended to go from week to week, and they stayed. They would have their various dilemmas, but the, their morphing as characters. Mm. I think was probably a, 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 a longer, slow burn element of the Pack to the Rafters series. Mm. Can we get a doing bit of the, a... the six, six hours? You know, they re- just just doing the six hours. All of them have changed very strongly by the end of that six hours. I just wanted to ask about some of these key characters, uh, Bevan, um, for this new season. I guess without giving yeah. quickly, without giving too many spoilers. So where we left uh, the season final with Pack to the Rafters, Dave and Julie sold up their home at the at the end of season six and travelled Australia with daughter Ruby. Where are they now as this uh, new season begins? They're in, they've settled in a country town. They've found a life in a country town. And one of the, once again, without spoilers, one of the dilemmas that arises is, you know, whether you have, whether you form a life away from the center of where the rest of your family is and i won't go into any more detail than that it's like you know how how intertwined do you have to be to be a a good family and how much have you drifted as a family if you have let those bonds fray too much from distance Mm. um uh yeah so um you know they've they've and they've, they've found you know, great contentment and happiness in this country town. And then I won't go into the details of what happens, but there is a MacGuffin that, that kicks the plot off around their daughter, Ruby, and that sort of leads things. Um, played it extraordinarily well by a young actress, Willow, um, who's um, quite um, quite an extraordinary young performer for her age. And yeah. um, it, it sets the show going. So let's move on to Nathan. Um, Saskia left to move overseas, so Nathan became a full-time parent to Edward. Although although Nathan was now just friends with Sammy, there did seem the possibility of some some romance again with Sammy. So where is Nathan? Yeah, look, can we can we stop? uh, Yeah, let's stop the questions right there from this point of view. That you are going back to pack to the rafters. Our lives change, and 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 just so you know, and I'm not trying to be rude to you in your questions, but I just think they're moot questions from the point of view that when you come in to do back to the rafters, it's a whole new entity. It's it's not a revisiting. It's a reboot, and we don't deny the continuity, but we are taking these people's lives six years down the track, and we're starting a really interesting and new piece, and we've only got six hours to tell the story, and. You know, if we had this huge dilemma in the first hour of how much to back reference and explain away all those things. But you meet somebody six years down the track in their life and, you know, like, for example, we don't pick up Rachel and Jake. Rachel and Jake clearly haven't worked out. She's a very driven career woman in New York when we pick her up mm. and there's a reference to them having not worked out. 
especially too because this is going overseas and there'll be international viewers who've probably never even seen Patch the Rafters. And also people are coming to it who forgot, you know, who might be new in Australia uh, to watch it and coming back. But to take time on a on a landscape to to um over explore explaining the gaps of where characters are that you never even see the characters we see it's very yeah. clearly explained and so you just pick it up and you go well if nathan's not with sammy then it didn't work out there is a reference to to jake and rachel not working out but it becomes quite clear when you see the way rachel is in her life this incredibly driven career woman if you look back and you think about the guy who was Jake, he he wouldn't that marriage that or you know that relationship wouldn't have survived. There's no yeah. question that he would decide. So we we felt that it was best rather than you know having new viewers going, who the hell are they talking about now? If Jake had been in it, and if we'd picked Jake up three episodes down then we would have prepared the audience for that. But there were reasons, you know, Jimmy, for example, who played Jake, was is a regular on Home and Away, and we couldn't get him. Yeah. Um, you know, Ryan Kaur is a very busy young actor, and we didn't want to pepper the landscape with too many characters, um, you know, where you've only got six hours and you've, you've already got, you know, you, you have to find room in the lives of the ones you know, had to find a wife for Ben. There's another character. Willow, yeah. uh, Ruby is now a fully functioning character and Edward, the young son of Nathan, fully functioning character. You had to find characters in the country to show that Dave and Julie had found a life in the country. So we got uh, Pado, Dave's mate, played by lovely Erin McGrath and Tessa played by Libby Tanner. So you put those characters in. Suddenly, you suddenly start to, if you then, if you think about bringing back in too many of the old, what I would call satellite characters, you end up with narrative spaghetti. So mm -hmm. having made that decision, you just go, okay, well, we're not going to have, we, we can't, we're not going to have this. We're not going to have that. We're not going to have that one. And having decided not to have them, you just go, you know, well, you come back into somebody's life six years later and they're not talking about, um, their ex-partner you go oh well they must have broken up you get what i mean yeah for sure uh and and so there is no discontinuity in there at all it's just that the characters you know we were interested in telling a story about the fact that as is happening with a number of men you know what happens for a man when he approaches 30 as a single father and um it's his life's not coming together, put him together with Sammy in a romance. You don't have that story to tell. Mm. Um, make Rachel with Jake, even if we could have had uh, Jimmy, you wouldn't have the story to tell of her story about what sacrifices must a driven career woman make mm. to have her career and how does her family feel about what they feel she's missing out on in life. So I didn't mean to be rude in cutting you off there, but you could have gone on, and you know, we, we could have gone on, we didn't have this one, this one, this one, this one. But it, it's not a continuation of Pat to the Rafters. It's a story about the life of the Rafters six years later. And I think the audience, like a suspension of disbelief or a journey of a leap of faith, they have to go, oh, well, this is where they are now. These are their new friends. I mean, God, in the last six years, I had people who were I was intimately close with six years ago that I never even think of now or, you know, may vaguely come up. So that's what we've done. And I think it's true to life in doing that. But it's also what came with the pragmatism of who we could or couldn't get on the landscape and not wanting too many characters peppering the landscape that you um, you simply can't service because you don't have the space in that six hours to service their story. So does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, it's actually a really good answer um, because of the people that are listening to the podcast that know Pack to the Rafters, um, 
I've watched some of the episodes and it is quite organic how the characters are moved on. Some some people are together, some people aren't. So he does just answer the question though, the overall question, maybe what, what has happened to some of those characters and stuff like that. So some people do like to tie up the loose ends and I think he did that with that question. But it does play out quite organically because as you say, six years has passed and people are up to different different parts in their life. Um, in, yeah, well, plus, see, plus Dave and Julie went on the road in their van. They were, they've they been away for six years. They, they've they lived on the road in their van for six years, topped home every now and then to see the kids or to, you know, visit Ted and check up on Ted and then gone back on the road again and end up in a country town. So I think the question might have been less moot if they had stayed in their house in the burbs and had the same life. Mm. But they had a radical life change and... Um, you know, God, I came over here from Perth in 79, a year after I'd been here. You know what I mean? The people from Perth in my past mm. were in my past, even though I'd been intimate friends with them. You just, you, 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 your connections fray organically. So, but, you know, there were pragmatic reasons too. You just can't squeeze too many characters into six hours of television and not end up with a gobbledygooky narrative. It's, um, it becomes too fractured. Well, but we've got, of, you know, we've got all the old favourites there, you know. Yeah, one of the big changes, though, of course, with Rachel is the actress change. Uh, Jessica is um, now Georgina is uh, the new Jessica. Are you happy with how yeah. that played out with change, changing the actress? Oh, Georgina's marvellous. Of course, it would be lovely to have had Jess there. But, you know, it, it was not right for Jess at that particular point in her life to be committing to the show. Um, so uh, um, we were in a dilemma. We sort of said to ourselves, do we have Rachel or, or, or don't we, given the fact that, you know, it was clearly not the uh, right decision for Jess to be with us. Um, and, um, uh, and we really felt that the mother-daughter bond was so important that um, we couldn't see it proceeding forth without the character and um, then Georgina came in and she's done a, done a, done a marvellous job, um, really, really, really marvellous job. And, um, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of recasts, I think it's been a very, very, personally, I think it's been a very, very successful recast. I was just wondering what your thoughts, generally speaking, are on, on recasts. I mean, I remember the big one was Pippa in Home and Away, who was Vanessa Downing and then became Deborah Lawrence. I remember when I watched at the time, I was outraged. You know, I thought, this is never going to work. I can't get used to this. But now, you know, years later, the only Pippa that you think of is the second Pippa, which was which was Deborah Lawrence. I mean, you got yeah. used to it after a while. What's your general thoughts about, you know, the good old character recast? Oh, look, you know, if the character is essential to the piece, if, if, if so, okay, let's put it this way. If somebody says, I love the show, and then watch backs to the rafters and takes attitude because Georgina's in there playing Rachel, then I question their love of the show. Mm. Because if you love the show, you, you, you know that we're not going to do that perversely. Um, and so you just go with the flow um, and you go and then you come in and you see a lovely performance and you see a good story and you follow it. And it's good. I, I mean, I'm a great believer in recasts are fantastic. And I think as long as they're well done, they um, make, make great sense because the only other choice if you don't recast is to lose the character. And I think that can damage the fabric of a show. I think, I don't think our six hours would have, be as good as they are if we had gone we don't want to recast and written out the character of Rachel and had a show without Rachel I think that show would be a lesser show than um any you know big uh, and and I think that the show's fantastic and as long as the audience comes in and they go well that's what was necessary to do to keep the character of Rachel in the show Georgina's performance is lovely. The storytelling is good. Um, and it's just taking, well, you know, take the time to adjust. And I think they will, um, uh, you know, because Georgina's performance is so lovely. We, we really were very lucky to find her. Uh, two other uh, characters, and this is not a spoiler, but I will tell listeners that the writing for Michael Caton playing Ted and his acting playing a grandparent with dementia 
is beautifully heartbreaking. Uh, heartbreaking, Bevan, you must have been Im- impressed with uh, Michael Caton's performance because for me, it, it, he's not in a huge amount of scenes, but the scenes that he does, it is absolutely heartbreaking. But, but the relationship between him and, and Julie is just, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, Mark, look, I'm impressed with Michael. <laughs> yeah, Michael's a national treasure. Um, and uh, he's extraordinary in the role. Um, it was important to, um, once again, because we had given him the, the condition uh, in the impact, uh, if he was going to come back, we had to be true to that and, uh, and um, show him with the same condition developed somewhat further um it's all well researched it's all based upon real experiences of people who have dealt with this very sad issue with um relatives um you know the guilt of um how much time do you spend with them you know often Mm. often with medical people saying you know the only person you're doing a service uh, you're doing no service to them and you're doing a disservice to yourself being here all the time you know it's not um, you know the guilt of not visiting as much because the you know um, uh, because there doesn't sort of seem to be any point to it. Uh, all those sorts of things that that so many people who have people in that situation have to deal with. I think we deal with it. Um, Michael's performance is, I think, as you say, is is absolutely brilliant. And I think it's a really, and we didn't have him in a huge amount of the storytelling. I mean, he's there and it's a very solid story, but it, 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 it is a very sad story. Um, but by the same token too, there's charm and whimsy in it as well, because Michael is a natural comedian. And I think at times we laugh with the condition and laugh with Ted, certainly never would want to in his condition laugh at him, but laugh with him. And, and, and the charm that can be found in him almost innocence sometimes comes with where that um, at times that condition can take mm-hmm. people in any given moment. Um, yeah. You know, the, the faux pas that can be made by the person, you know, um, in this PC world, you know, the faux pas that can be made by the person with his sort of condition. You know, it, it, I, I think it's a really lovely story and um, one of the great strengths of the six hours. There was oh, and always... I'm glad you, you know, were moved by it. Oh, it was it was beautiful. Um, there was always going to be new characters in in the show, of course. Um, and uh, Libby Tanner is is part of the cast this season. She, of course, worked with Eric on All Saints. Uh, love Libby. She's such an authentic actress. I don't. That's the only word that I can really use. Um, I guess you're a fan of Libby's work. It was great to have her part of this part of this cast. Oh, Libby's fa- fantastic. Um... Uh, she worked with Eric and I on a serial called Pacific Drive. Oh, I remember that late night on Channel on 9. Yeah. And um, uh, she then uh, was in All Saints. And then she was the, one of the leads in my show Headland, which is now sh- showing on 7 Plus uh, in their line up there. So Lib, Lib and I have done quite a bit of work together and she's wonderful. And um, she's fantastic in the role of Tessa. You know, we wanted to create a friend for Julie in this country town and somebody different than Julie's friend in the city, Donna. Um, and um, Libby's come in and done a wonderful job with it. Uh, yeah, I had great admiration for her. Yeah. And just a quick question to, I guess, tick off. It's now called Back to the Rafters instead of yeah. Pack to the Rafters. Is that just a to distinguish itself that it's on Amazon now or that just that a number of years have passed and this is a slightly, you know, different show? Oh, when, you know, I just didn't think that when we were coming back to it, we could call it Pack to the Rafters again because it is a different beast. Um, It is about the Rafters family, but it is Pack to the Rafters was that show about the Rafters. This is about the Rafters and we thought what, I've always felt it had to have a title change to really say this is, you know, something, a, a revisiting. And um, it just sort of seemed because of packed and back rhyming with pack, mm-hmm. I don't know, back to the rafter sound, sounded like really natural. And, um, you know, uh, you know, we could have called it, um, you know, 
uh, round, you know, another round with the rafters or something like that. And I just don't think it would have, you know, brought up images. I think when you say back to the rafters, it, 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 you get the best of both worlds. It says it's a new show, but because of that rhyming of back with packed, it really feels you're conflating the two together. You know what I mean? So um, it just seemed to be um, a God given title for this new piece but i was always convinced it had to have a new title in some way shape or form to separate it out because it is a different beast it's a, it's the same world it's the same people it's the same tone but it's six years later and just as the world has changed in six years i think the rafters has changed in six years um and i th- and i think that needs to be reflected i think it keeps the uh, the two titles between two worlds perhaps that was that. Oh, uh, well, there that, you, that, that there was you a go. pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a title for a show. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. So, so, are you able to tell us a little bit about how the whole Amazon thing came about? Um, is, is it oh, clearly it's not on Seven now; it's on Amazon. Um, did did you approach Amazon, or how did the whole thing come about about creating Back to the Rafters? They came up. I think they were looking to um, get a footprint in the Australian. Uh, marketplace, uh, Amazon Prime Video, and they saw that this had been a very successful Australian franchise. Um, They approached Seven. It was their idea to consider some form of revisiting of the Rafter family. They approached uh, Seven. Uh, Discussions took place and then I was approached. Um, I, I wasn't initially enthusiastic because I just just wasn't sure. I just didn't want to I didn't revisit in a sort of like a pragmatic desultory way. But until I and then but there was such enthusiasm from them to see maybe it for have an incarnation on this their platform. Um and and so then I've found this breakthrough of of, of a story I really wanted to tell that I could tell because I, I right best when I come from a very personal place and to tell this story that was very strong, you know, to, to my emotional experience and, and translate it through Dave and Julie and then explore then different stories with the kids and even Ted's story with the dementia, um, tell truths about the experiences that a number of my friends are going through with their parents with that condition. Um, I, then I saw there were a lot, there was you know, truths to tell. I also felt as well, um, this is personal as distinct from you know Amazon's imperative, which was a, a true desire to resurrect a national icon and, and, and embrace it for their platform and for international viewers as well. Mm. But, but I, I, I also felt that, um, uh, you know, I suddenly stopped seeing finished business um, uh, 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 and and saw unfinished business. And I thought that we needed a really life optimistic show in these times because a lot of drama now, which I watch and enjoy thoroughly, but it can be quite life pessimistic in in, in a lot of its tones and a lot of its storytelling, Uh, not criticizing it because I love watching a lot of those life pessimistic shows, but there are quite a lot of harsh life pessimistic shows out there. Mm. And um, I suddenly felt maybe it would be nice to revisit the rafters and channel a bit of life optimism from myself through them and then, you know, marry that feeling to the very strong feeling that that, that, um, Amazon Prime Video had regarding what they wanted for their their platform. I know many people will... Uh, ask this i'm not sure whether there's an answer yet is this a limited series or is there talks if, the, if, if this does well that we're going back back to the rafters again oh it, 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 you know be nice there's nothing um has been set upon or agreed upon at the moment i guess it will depend upon what the reaction to it is i mean initial reaction i mean it's lovely to hear what you had to say about the first three episodes we're getting some great initial feedback um you know you never say never but that pragmatic decision about any future i guess will depend upon pragmatic pragmatic results 
in an hour. So we wait and we see. All I know is that we've made a show we're very proud of and we're very pleased with the initial responses that we're getting sure. um, and hope that they're indicative of the general responses overall that we get. I mean, I'm sure there will still be some people who, 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 who love the show and, you know, um, might feel, I don't know, in some way, shape or form, we haven't hit the mark with it. But I personally um, feel that we really have. And I'm glad that from what you say, you feel that we've sort of, you know, got ourselves in the ballpark there. All right. Well, finally, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, this is somewhat of a reboot, I guess. The Americans are absolutely loving the reboots over the last couple of years. What are, what are your thoughts about reboots and remakes? Because um, I, I guess I was wanted to ask what the special ingredient is, because some of them seem to bring back the same cast and it works, and then sometimes it doesn't work. And then on other, other times they make a whole new version with new a new cast that works or it doesn't work. So what is it, do you think, that is that special ingredients that makes a reboot actually work and why some just completely fail? Um, I can't speak for other people's shows. I just know that I don't think this could have succeeded, which I think it will, if everyone hadn't come back to it with love and passion and a feeling that there was a point to being back together again other than just getting back together to, I don't know, make money or, I don't know, whatever. Um, we all came back together again. The whole cast were enthusiastic to come back. Um, uh, and when I once I found the story I wanted to tell, I was really G'd up and, you know, Chris Martin-Jones returned as a producer and, and, and the directors came back in and, and like, um, the passion, the, the, the true passion to feel that there is something further, not re to repeat, there is something further worth saying about these people that is going to give something more to the people who have previously loved them or, in fact, give something to people who've never experienced them before. Um, in terms of, like, for example, an international audience, I think the ones that haven't worked, I suspect, are the ones where there was nothing further to say. It was just like going back into the same old field and wandering around and picking up the stalks of the wheat that you'd already harvested. Mm. You know, whereas I think we've grown a whole new crop. And, 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 and that, I think, all the ones that I think have succeeded go and grow a whole new crop. They don't go and try and dig out um, you know, you know, dig up soil from a field that's well, well and truly played out. Mm. Um, that's just my theory. Um, I don't want to disservice other people who probably come in and work very, very hard to, to make their shows. There can also be a cynical reason. There was no cynicism at all in from anyone, um, especially Amazon. The Amazon um, people were so um, ebulliently eager to um, pay honour to a very, very successful franchise by seeing it into a future and in a future that had a strong international component. Mm. So there, was no, there wasn't an ounce of cynicism or uh, calculation. It was just love for the project. Um, and if I hadn't felt that, I couldn't have done it. It's because I felt that, because I felt that glowing out of them when they first approach that's what made me sort of go away and challenge myself and go why are you being an old churl here saying you don't think you can find it and made me find it so i i, I guess that's it um passion and the sense that we're we're, we're furthering the franchise not just taking it around for another run around the block well from a from a viewer point of view uh if you enjoyed Pack to the Rafters, you will enjoy Back to the Rafters. And the main reason is I thought that the heart of Pack to the Rafters was, was the authenticity of that family and just seeing them again. And there are new storylines story and a whole, you know, uh, you know, a slightly different cast with some people, but the authenticity of that family and, and their love for each other just shines through again and you just fall in love all over again. So it's absolutely amazing. Uh, Bevan, thank you so much for your time. I do have Eric standing by, but I do thank you um, 
for your time um, and for bringing the magic of the rafters back to our screens. What a legend. Thank you very much. Thanks for loving the, the magic. Um, it, it, it's very rewarding to hear you say the things you just said. Thank you. Bevan Lee, creator and writer of Back to the Rafters, which again is coming up on September 17th on Amazon Prime Video. And yes, now to Eric Thompson. He may have been born in Scotland and emigrated and lived in New Zealand for a couple of decades, but like we do with the best of the best New Zealand actors, we claim them as our own. Dave Rafter himself, Eric Thompson, is here now, and thanks for joining me today. Nice to, nice to speak to you. Well, the last few years worldwide in television has been um, an era of reboots. Some screen success and others have been complete disasters. Were you hesitant at all about going back to the rafters? Um, that is a lot of magic back in the hearts of many Australians. Yeah, yeah, obviously uh, a, little bit, a little bit hesitant. Um, there, there'd been a few attempts since we finished to get us back together, but um we i think they were trying to get us back and and they would say oh we'll, we'll do a mini series or we'll do like a telly movie but then it would always say well how about we just make another 13 or episodes we're going on a week that's that's the old series so i think there was and there was availability issues all the way through too so uh when finally that the final package came through which was the six apps with the amazon prime everyone was available um and bevan was back on board i just went okay we're, we're, we're kind of back with the people um, who started it out. And uh, if we're ever going to do this, now's the best time to do it. And yeah, the, look, yeah, a little bit nervous to see how it'll be, it'll be um, appreciated, but um, too late now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned in my uh, interview with Bevan that it, it appears that like no time has even passed when you watch the episodes. Yeah, sure, characters were doing different things in their life, but the, the magic and the spirit of the Rafters family unit was so much alive. Did it feel the same reuniting with um, Rebecca, Hugh, Michael and Angus? Yeah, well, firstly, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, certainly, it's it's good to get that kind of feedback. And, and yeah, reuniting, I mean, we, we spent 122, we made 122 episodes. We spent a huge amount of time together and throughout that time we we all experienced aspects of each other's lives i mean rebecca had a baby we had a baby when we started and then we had another one three years into it so we were kind of our lives were kind of um enmeshed from that point onwards so and we've obviously kept in touch over the years so walking back on set and looking back at these very very familiar faces very familiar energies mm -hmm. with people that you know so well it um yeah that that chemistry and that respect and understanding is still there and i think i think to begin with that was what we had at the very very beginning of the whole show that of packed the rafters was we had a kind of instant rapport and if anything that's just grown over the years mm. uh bevan mentioned that uh, dave and julie are at a moment in their relationship where they may possibly want different things in simple terms i think it's fair to say dave is looking to chapter two of his life um as most of the kids aside from ruby are obviously older and doing their own thing and julie wants to stay in chapter one do you think the audience might have more empathy towards dave or julie ah oh, look it's it's hard to tell um we've, we've a little a couple of uh scenes have already gone out in social media and it's interesting seeing the the uh some of the comments because um Rebecca Gibney is so popular and so loved and has a way of kind of uh, creating empathy for her character so beautifully <laughs> that I, I wouldn't be surprised if even if people disagreed with what she was doing, they would agree with her. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a few occasions doing rafters where we wanted to have an even kind of spread so that the discussion was, was you know, an evenly spread um, discussion. But um, most of the time people aired on, on her side of the argument. So I think um, it, it'll depend who you talk to, um, but I think, and I'm prepared, fully prepared for uh, people marching up to me in the supermarket and going, you should just go back to the children. You should do, um, <laughs> I'm kind of expecting, expecting that. But at the same time, um, I think it's a, a very, very true uh, representation of a, of a moment that probably all couples that have been together for a long time have is they, um, they have to check in and wonder, are they still on the same page? And um, what does their future, what does the, the, the remaining time of their life look like and how they, how they want to play that card? So whatever happens with allegiances, um, 
I'm. I think that we have a really robust discussion in this in, in this series, and uh, I'm very much looking forward and a little bit apprehensive as to the feedback that we might get. I think it's going to be great. But um, you said earlier about there was hints that maybe we might get back together for rafters and stuff like that. But how out of the blue was this particular phone call? I'm just interested in how a phone call like this happens. Does someone literally get on the phone to you saying, Eric, uh, we're thinking about doing new rafters with Amazon. Do you want in? Is that, is that how it works? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, in a nutshell, I suppose it does. Um, I mean, my first thing was, you know, because like I said, it had happened a few times before. Um, and my question is, well, well, is everyone on board? You know, um, when is this going to happen and how real is this approach? Um, and to, in this case, whenever I asked those questions, um, there was a solid answer. Mm. And um, we uh, and I just went, oh, so this is actually going to happen. Yep. And then the contract arrives and, you know, the negotiations kind of happen and it's kind of all happening. And, and all the time I'm expecting it, something to go wrong, something, someone to pull out or some situation to happen. Um, but it just kept on marching forward. And the next minute we're in a in a read through and uh, looking at each other going, wow. Now we've got to make it, you know, it was, yeah. but, it, you know, to begin with, it just does start with that phone call. But like I said, it's, uh, it's like trying to, you know, everyone was busy and everyone was doing their own thing. So um, to, to get us all available and all interested and, and ready to go was, uh, it was, um, it was quite a feat of uh, management from Julie McGoran and Chris Martin Jones, everyone at, uh, at Seven Studios. Well, for either storytelling reasons or because the actor or actress was not available due to other commitments, some of the key recurring characters were unable to return. Is there anyone especially that you missed at this? Because I guess you could call it a reunion. Oh, look, everyone. I mean, obviously, you know, Ryan, Cor, Brooke, Satchel, you know, people who people who had uh, played a big part in the latter stages of, of Rafters. Um, but I suppose, you know, you know, the decision was we, we had six episodes. We were f focusing in on the tight rafters unit. We also, you know, I mean, getting those two together as well probably, probably pushed it one step too far and getting us all back together. But I think it was realistically that uh, that we needed to, to really focus on the rafters, uh, focus on mum, dad and the kids and whatever life was there. The, the, the Ryan's character was fantastic and his storyline was, was always brilliant. Um, but it, it was when, when you were shooting 22 episodes a year, having those other story strands were always important to keep the variety up. And especially when you've got an actor of Ryan's you know, standard. So yeah. uh, the decision was made early that we just, uh, yeah, we just focused solidly on the Rafter family. And I think it was the correct decision. Absolutely. Um, it must have been a, a double shot reunion uh, for you, though, with reuniting with All Saints actress Libby Tanner. She's awesome um, on the on the new rafters playing Tessa. Was it was it uh, nice working together again with Libby? Yeah, uh, look, Libby and I, we, we started our career, well, I started my career in Australia together on a show called Pacific Drive up on the Gold Coast back in 95. She was in that, and uh, we worked together for two years on that, and obviously four years on, on All Saints. We used to share a house together in Sydney. Um, she's a very, very, very dear friend of mine, uh, but we, you know, we don't see much of each other but uh when i heard that they'd cast her i was uh, i was thrilled to spend a bit of time with her and you know libby libby is probably i think probably one of the most underrated um actors we have in this country she is consistently brilliant at what she does there's a truth to her work um and i knew at that point that she would be adding a whole other level to the show and um, she certainly did uh, Seven Studios is still behind the making of the show, of course, but it is now going out on Amazon Prime Video. Was there any major differences filming a show for Amazon as opposed to with Seven? Uh, well, there was a lot of differences full stop in that, we, you know, when we were shooting it for Seven, we were shooting 60% in studio, 40% in location. We had the st studio was next to the Home and Away studio. It was all much more networky. It was all kind of there in, in the building at Everly in Sydney. Um, uh, this was 100% location. It was the, the producers, uh, the, the Amazon side, were all in Los Angeles. So we had uh, at read-throughs, we were having, you know, Zoom read-throughs. People were dialing in, we were getting filmed and microphoned, and it was all, it was all a, a kind of next level international production. 
Um, and then we would have, you know, Amazon execs coming down um, and sitting in on set. And, you know, that, it was just really exciting to have this, this kind of American energy there on set and this kind of big world. And then, of course, you know, COVID hit and suddenly we all, we all had to go back to the Zoom calls um, in terms of their, their, them on set. And at some points there were live feeds of what we were shooting um, going back to America so they could keep a, keep an eye on us, yeah. um, which was uh, we had to be a little bit careful because, you know, the, the, the Australian sense of humor and uh, some of the, uh, you know, the off the ball discussions, you know, but we um, now we look, we worked it out really, really well, but I, they've, they've been fantastic. And, and really without Amazon Prime, we, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here doing it. So they they brought a massive amount of energy um and a commitment that that brought us all it was the final kind of power in the magnet really to get us all back i mentioned at the start of the interview that you were born in scotland and emigrated to new zealand now i don't know how i didn't know this but i didn't know that rebecca gibney was actually a kiwi until last last week because we all just call her a you know australian i, I actually didn't know that um we, you know, we love to claim Kiwis as our own. Um, I understand that she left New Zealand earlier than yourself, but did you actually know Rebecca as far back as um, New Zealand growing up? No, not at all. Now, Rebecca was in, in Australia firmly before I was. So she, I think she came over here when she was about 19. She's a couple of years older than I am. Um, and so I didn't come over here until about, I was 28. Yep. Um, so she'd been in, in Australia for a solid 10 years and just, absolutely having a, an amazing career so i you know she was as much an icon to me watching her from new zealand as a, a whole lot of other new zealanders know so but she yeah she uh she grew up in wellington and you know she we, we've got a lot of and i you've studied in, in wellington and know it really well so there's a few places that we have um we have a lot of uh cultural references that we can rely on and i think uh an inbuilt new zealand kind of psychology mentality view of the world that i think um is one of the reasons we we get on so well is that we kind of understand each other's foundational you know development and yeah it's uh we we, we have a lot of fun with that now she's living in dunedin and that's where i started my career at the fortune theater in dunedin so there's a, again another another overlap oh wow um, I wanted to mention, if I can, your beautiful wife, Caitlin, who was, uh, you've been married for, I'm going by the numbers, about 22 years now, is that right? 22 years, yeah. Well, so where did you guys meet? Now, I was trying to match your acting work and maybe guess you met through Xena Warrior Princess, but that was just a guess. How, how did you guys meet? <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we just, that, that was because Caitlin was uh, in, in Auckland with me when I was working over there and she, she scored a role. But we met, uh, we met in 1997 grand final day at the Dogs Bar in Melbourne when, okay. uh, the, the, uh, when the Adelaide Crows were playing the um, St Kilda. And I, neither of us were into football, but the, the, people, the people I was staying with were mutual friends. And St Kilda hadn't been in the grand final since 1966 or something. So Caitlin and I sat together and we just started talking and the game was happening in, in the background and St Kilda were losing. Um, but we were getting to know each other. And so we just met through mutual friends. And then, um, yeah, we, we managed to, to kind of sync our lives up, um, which is often very difficult for actors. But we managed to do it for a couple of years and long enough for us to to take it to the next level and get married and um yeah so that yeah and then we we obviously we worked together on on the alice a, a few years later after she'd done always greener just because posy graham evans at nine uh just really liked her and liked us and she called us up and she just had, called me and caitlin up and how would you guys feel about working together and we thought it would be great so we um we gave that a shot too so um yeah that was uh yes it's been a, a nice journey well, let me ask you about the uh, Alice and uh, working together. Um, working together, married together, is that a good combination? Because I know for some couples, they might that that sounds like a probably a disaster for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, we were a bit concerned that we wouldn't have any chemistry on screen. Um, that would be a little bit a little bit embarrassing. Um, no, it 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 worked. Um, it worked really well, uh, simply because we, we we didn't have kids at the time. Uh, my cattle dog, our cattle dog Russ, was in it with us as well, which was great because we didn't know what to do with him while we were flying back and forth to Alice Springs. So he would just come with us and be in the be in the TV show. Um, so you know, having an opportunity to it was such an adventure because we went off and we were shooting up in the Red Center and we were getting to know a lot about the land and I was getting to 
peek into the, you know, behind the kind of East Coast understanding of what Australia was and um, understanding Australia much more holistically. And uh, so, yeah, we, we were just having an amazing time you know we we went up in wow. a hot air balloon one morning as part of the shoot and she managed to get on as, as the boom swinger uh, because it was only cr crew and cast but she wasn't in the cast in that scene so the, wow. the first ad said oh you, you hold that and you can record the sound and you can go up and we did a, a dawn um we were sprinkling ashes as part of a storyline and caitlin was the boom swinger and i was working with uh with Jessica Napier and uh, there we were soaring above the red center, watching big red kangaroos bouncing around. It was a pretty magical moment. So we had, we had all those kind of experiences together. So any little logistical niggles that we might've experienced were sort of paled in significance. And since there's a, um, a love for reboots these days, one of my favorite shows that absolutely left uh, us before its time was a show that you've just mentioned, um, and that was Always Greener, starring the lovely Caitlin McDougall. Any chance that you yeah. could uh, ask her to make some calls to see who might be interested in that one? That would be great having that show back. Well, it, it would be great, you know, and I, I, again, it was, you know, that was a sad kind of moment because we had... Uh, I think David Leckie came on board at seven and they made some pretty strange, you know, decisions. And, and I think they were very much regretted it. That was another Bevan Lee show. Yeah. And in some ways, um, this iteration of, of Back to the Rafters draws on that because we have the city family, the city country family split that we had in Always Greener. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, what Dave's going through and Julia are going through is kind of the, the kind of things that uh, John Howard and Ann Tenney went through and mm. in that show. So th there is there is actually, you know, quite a lot of Always Greener in this in, in Back to the Rafters. Uh, Rafters came after Always Greener. And I, I think because Bevan was so disappointed about Always Greener that um, I think he, he, he funneled that in. So, I mean, I, you know, the, the actors in that production are still around. I think it would be wonderful. It was a great show and it was one of those just terrible network decisions if i can be so bold to um to to cut it off in its prime because it was doing so well yeah absolutely always green i'd be love to have that one back as well um many actors that um have had such an extensive career across many shows films um uh are always you know a particular role is often fondly remembered by people with yourself though it's a bit different it could be dave rafter but it could also be george turner or it could be mitch stevens so does most of the recognition come from rafters or 800 words or all saints or maybe something else uh look it it, it kind of depends you know like it, it depends I, I, it's surprising occasionally i've got a um funnily enough a, all Saints was was a very very popular show in Iran, oh. um, and they and every few years they they replay it all. Uh, I guess they've they've censored it, censored it, or they just have it, you know, sitting in their cupboard. They dust it off every few years. So I've got a huge pe amount of people in Iran that love Mitch Stevens, and and little do they know that I'm now you know twenty years older than Mitch Stevens. <laughs> um, they're they're usually very disappointed when they see my my recent photographs, but. There's a so I'm kind of that that thing is still around and obviously rafters is is massive, um, but then always greener. Uh, sorry, eight hundred words um, was a much loved show as well. So I, it it it's pr probably spreads evenly among the three. I, I'm just really I've cut myself really really lucky and very very grateful to have three great shows, three very successful shows that I was involved in still being fondly remembered. So um, I don't really mind, you know, I'm, most of the time I'm quite happy that no one recognizes me at all. But if, if, if they do, whatever comes out of their mouth, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of each of those shows. So how was doing um, Aftertaste then for the ABC? Because that was certainly not a Dave Rafter or, or um, Mitch Stevens kind of role. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that's exactly why I did it because oh, I, I've, I've done that. I've done Dave Rafter, Mitch Stevens, George Turner. You know, they're all kind of the same kind of guy. You know, uh, and I wanted to do something different. Um, uh, that's really, you know, very important to reinvigorate myself and, and keep, you know, keep myself active and and and, and focused on on continuing to explore, you know, this world. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was a huge amount of fun, and uh, that was the whole point behind it—to do something so so um, out of out of the ordinary. And I know we pro I probably um, alienated a few of the more conservative fans uh, of, <laughs> of of me previously, but 
I kind of felt that I, 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 I'd earned that because I'd done so much in that, in that zone that um, I was probably more doing it for myself uh, than for anyone else to make sure that I, I was being really satisfied and not really thinking of the, or the audience is going to, you know, find this a little bit, you know, confrontational seeing me. So, um, you know, aggressive and, and a bit, a bit rude. So um, I just, I just went for it and, you know, I was really, really glad with how it turned out. All right. So second, last question, um, just about maybe some of the work that you've got coming up. I know you've got a new film, uh, how to, how to Please a Woman. I mean, that's got a massive cast yep. in it too. Miles Pollard, Roz Hammond, Cameron Daddo, Taslin Walton. Um, so so what's coming up for you? And um, yeah. Yeah, well, um, well, that we shot that film in Perth uh, in Fremantle in uh, April. And so that's going to be coming out toward the end of the uh, end of the year or early next year. Um, I've got a couple of other things that are locked in, but, you know, like a lot of productions these days, they really make you sign non-disclosure kind of clauses so tightly um, that if that if I told you what was going on, I'd probably, I don't know, I'd probably a, a drone would come down and pick me up and take me off somewhere. I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, there's a few things, a few things, a couple of things happening. And um, I've just got, a, I've got a film in, in uh, that, uh, that I did a couple of years ago called Coming Home in the Dark, which is a, you know, psychological thriller that I made that's in, in theatres at the moment in, in Australia, but not many because most of Australia, well, the big side of Australia is all all um, shut. So uh, it's in Perth and Adelaide and Brisbane and um, Hobart. And uh, yeah, look, I've I've been I've been lucky. I've managed to work through the pandemic and a few things a few things circling around. So uh, you'll you'll hear all about them in due course, I'm sure. Well, finally, uh, Eric, the big three shows we've talked about, All Saints, 800 Words and Rafters, you've been nominated for the Silver Logie for Most Popular Actor and won it for All Saints in 800 Words, but strange enough, not for Rafters. So when the next Logies happen, <laughs> who knows when that's going to happen? Do you think there's a, there's a chance, uh, a golden chance to claim the missing Logie for Rafters? <laughs> um, no, there's, I'll, I'll give you two words. Um, that'll sum up why that probably will never happen. And that's Hugh Sheridan. Um, Hugh, uh, you know, Hugh was massively popular in rafters and I think, you know, he still is. And so, you know, we, we were always nominated. Hugh always, always won the, the award. And I, look, I'm, I'm, you're lucky enough to get one of those things. I've kind of realised just how difficult it is to get them. Uh, I've managed to get a couple. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sort of as motivated. I think the, you know the the Logie Awards are you know, problematic these days with um, so with streaming shows and with digital you know voting and stuff. It's sort of I don't know. It, it's a little bit different than back in the day. We had to rip the voucher out of the out of the magazine and send it off. So um, yeah, I've, and they've been cancelled two years in a row. So yeah, very very much hoping you know. But I, I, it, now that we've got so many shows on streaming um, platforms, um, we'll start see start seeing more of more of them and uh, involved in the Logies. So you never know. I mean, but like I said, I'm not really motivated by it. And Hugh's, Hugh's the, he's the, he's the fly in that ointment. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for sharing a little bit about Caitlin as well. We'd love to see her back on the box soon too, but um, good yeah. luck with uh, back to the rafters. Um, thank you so much.